Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is author Robert McCammon. McCammon's horror and fantasy novels have been enormously successful. The post-apocalyptic Swan Song sold over a million copies and sat for a long time on the New York Times bestseller list. Over time, McCammon's work has evolved. The 1991 bestseller, Boy's Life, is a mixture of realism and magic. Boy's Life was required reading in high schools all over America. In Speaks the Nightbird, McCammon created Matthew Corbett, the South Carolina 17th century detective. There are now six Matthew Corbett novels, the latest being Freedom of the Mask. Please join me here at the Alabama Booksmith as I speak with author Robert McCammon. Well, Rick, it is good to see you. Thank you very much. You and I have met just in passing over the years, but we've <laughs> never right. sat down to have this conversation right. before. Right. But I understand that we did spend four years together in Tuscaloosa. We did. Uh, well, we were ships that passed in the night, I think. <laughs> what did you do in Tuscaloosa at the university? Well, uh, mostly I was um, involved with the Crimson White, the paper, newspaper. I started out as a feature writer, and I became the editor of that of the paper. And that uh, took a lot of time. So I, you know, I enjoyed doing that, but it was like a full-time job. But you know, it was it was fun. Editors of campus newspapers are they're like football players, really. They shouldn't be oh, required to take I mean, classes. Was, well, that's true. I mean, really, because <laughs> you know, I, looking back, I I miss so many classes because of late nights. Yeah. But you know, it, yeah. and it, it just happened that we, we had to work like all night long almost to get the thing going. But uh, I found myself. I always worked at night anyway. I always wrote stories late at night, and I still work uh, late, late night, so it just kind of fit my schedule anyway. I've read that after you left the university, you came back up here to Birmingham. Yeah. And you may have moved around a little bit, but there's this dust jacket kind of list of jobs you had for a year. What did you do, well, a year, I, or two years, three years? You were uh, worked, advertising? I worked at Lovins, the advertising department, uh, worked at a bookstore, worked at B. Dalton bookstore. Um, oh. So, you know, I just kind of bumped around. I worked at Post Herald. Um, it worked at the, on the copy desk at the Post Herald. Uh, and uh, I did headlines, uh, check people's stories. And uh, I, I wanted to do feature stories for the, for the Post Herald. And I, I went out and did, I did a couple of short feature stories, but they were never published. But anyway, at, at the Post Herald, and this editor is no longer there, he told me, he said, you, as long as you're at this paper, you will never write a feature story because you're on the copy desk. That is your role. Your role is to write headlines and, and, and check other people's stories. Huh. So I found myself in really a dead-end job. I mean, I'm not going anywhere. So uh, I thought, how am I going to get out of this? <laughs> and so I began to write my first book, and that was like 70, 78, 79 or something. Ball was It was. That was the first one. Now, before you wrote that book, <clears throat> I have to, I, I assume that <laughs> I, this has to be true. You must have read a lot of that kind of thing. What did you read? You know, I, I grew up uh, with a grandfather who told me ghost stories uh -huh. and, and read ghost stories to me. And for whatever reason, you know, I really can't explain it. I've always been interested in the supernatural. I've always been interested in the, in the sort of out, out, uh, out, out of the world sort of, sort of writing and reading. So I don't remember that I was really reading anything in particular when I started to write my first book. But I think it was all the culmination of all the stories that I had heard and just the general, general feeling of, you know, I, I have the story that I want to tell about good and evil, and I'm in this dead-end job, I, and so it just, just all came out, and, and there yeah. it was. So the, this little narrative that I concocted in my head where you're sitting around reading Stephen King and Dean R. Koontz, <laughs> not true, necessarily. No, not true. No, not true. All right. No, no. Now. But, but, <laughs> but true in the sense that, that that's why I got published because these guys were very popular at the oh, time. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and w when, I, you know, when I began to write my book, I thought, I never, I never conceived of the fact that I would ever make any money at this or, have, or make a career out of it. It was just, you know, well, I got this book I want to write, and we're going to see what happens with it, okay? So it astounded me that it, it actually took off and, and actually was published. Well, you published your first book. Uh, my first book. It, and and, and, the and first it's book. noteworthy because when people write about you, that's one of the things they remember to say, is that 
is that uh, they say it later when they're talking about Speaks the Nightbird. They say, this man has never suffered disappointment. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Well, well, the first book did get accepted and it, come it, out. Yeah, and, and, but it put me in an interesting situation in that, uh, you know, I think the first four, the first three or four books I, I wrote, are they're okay. You know, they're okay. I know people like them. You know, but, and I say that because I have progressed, I think, in a good way as a writer. And I never had, I never had a Trump novel. I mean, most writers have several Trump novels right. that they that they start, they do, and it's like this is not very good. You just put that. <laughs> so I didn't really have a Trump novel, and and so I learned to write in public, which is sort of a difficult thing to do because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to look back and you're going to say, oh gosh, that that's not, it's not as nearly as good as what I can do now. But it was as good as it was the best I could do at the time, and that's kind of the way that I have to have to go with it. It. It is a kind of genre fiction. It has a kind of niche audience. It, it was does, successful. It does. Sure. It's all positive. Here's my question. And a lot of times on this show, like a lawyer, I ask questions that I know the answer to. Okay. Right. This is not <laughs> yeah. one this, oh, is, not this is not one, one of one? them. Okay. <laughs> this okay. Is, this is a question I don't you're gonna this is you you explaining something to me that I really don't have much feelings about. Okay. People are people love horror and fantasy. Um, I, I have read a lot of science fiction, but yeah. I've never gotten hooked yeah. on horror and fantasy and, and the supernatural yeah. and the blood coming down the inside of the walls. Or the, Those are cliches. Those are all cliches. You know, try to keep away from the cliches. <laughs> all right. all right. you know? What is it, then you're, you're the producer, you're at one end, and you're thinking, I'm, I'm writing these books, and people are reading them, why are they reading? Why do they love them? What is it about them that, that what's the need? What's the satisfaction? Why do people pick it, up these and love them? It, it all comes down to me, and I think any writer of any genre will tell you this, it comes down to character. If you can mm -hmm. get the reader to identify with the character in a, in a strange situation, you know, this is, this is me. What would I do if suddenly I found uh, a, a, a demonic uh, face coming out of the, 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 the uh, painting I've just bought? You know, go, start with there. Start there. A demonic face comes out of a painting I've just bought. What's it going to do? And, and you, you put yourself in the, you make it real. You make it as real as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge for, as a writer sure. to make something outlandish. Or is it? Because, hey, I've read about things like that. I've read that people say they bought uh, photographs and weird things come out of the photo. <laughs> I've read about that. Is it, is it that off the wall? Who knows? But the challenge is taking something that is off the wall and making it real to the reader that the reader can identify with. Um, you know, I, I think, just personally, I think that uh, uh, probably there are less readers for the horror genre now than there were, say, 20 or 30 years ago because, mm. because the world has become so um, horrific. Let's put it that way. You know, the world has become much more dangerous and, and horrific in a way mm. than it was, say, 30 years ago. Well, the Swan Song, which is your... McCarthy has the road. Aldous, yeah, uh, the, Aldous Huxley has the, the, uh, his versions, but these are these. This is a subgenre, a splinter group of post-apocalyptic right, fiction. Right. And your take on the post-apocalypse is pretty <laughs> grim. Oh yeah. Well, again, you're putting the reader in a situation where you think, well, what would you do if this happened? Where would you be if this happened? What, where? How would you? How would you take care of yourself? What would you do? Where would you go? And so uh, uh, it, it's, yeah. it's it, in a way, it's like presenting a problem or presenting a, a waking nightmare that, that allows the reader uh, latitude to figure yeah, out, yeah. how am I going to deal with, how would I deal with this? If it were up to me yeah. in the post-apocalyptic <laughs> world, we would never again have electricity. <laughs> Well, that's right. I would Your electric electricity would be gone. <laughs> I so. mean, I would never. It, some people talk about. I, I suppose if you if if we were having a conversation with a whole room full of say electrical engineer professors or something, <laughs> and they say, "Oh, we'll we'd get right back to work on oh, that." Yeah. But if yeah. you had a room full of writers, we would all be sitting around a campfire right. for the for the rest of our that's, lives. That's right. There'd be no electricity or television or yeah. a penicillin or anything else. <laughs> well, I just went to the Sahar Writers Meeting in uh, in Las Vegas, and one of the things uh -huh. we talked about there, and I've, I've heard other writers talk about this, and probably all writers from every, every genre talk about this, is, is the, the, uh, the cell phone has made writing suspense novels much more difficult because everybody is always in contact. Uh, uh, sure, the, the, sure. The, the, the quote horror novel or the suspense novel, uh, by necessity you must have someone 
feeling uh, uh, separate, apart. Yep. Uh, and how do they do that when right. they can easily pick up a cell phone and you're in, or you're in charge, you're in contact with you know tons of people. Right. So in every book, you have to figure out a way to diminish yeah. communication yeah. with a cell phone or computer. So, by eliminating them by, all, I, you I, have in some way eliminated <laughs> it. You know, well, you know, in the history of the English novel, um, people talk about this, that in the sense that communication technology has always altered the English yeah. novel. Yeah, yeah. The, sure. the 18th century epistolary novel, those, the Tom Jones, even yeah. the, those yeah. novels, the letter took four days. Absolutely and right. All, the, sure. And before the person received the letter with the information that was needed. Yeah a lot of mischief could happen. Yeah. The telephone eliminated the epistolary yeah, right, novel. Right. <laughs> the cell phone may be eliminating <laughs> so, all suspense. That's right. Well, it's it's fun for me to go back and do the Matthew Corbett series because I all get right. to live in that world also and I have to deal with that the, the time. I don't have to deal with cell phones, right. thank goodness, in the Matthew Corbett series. But you know, you have to deal with uh, uh, travel distances. Uh, just the time it takes How for something to happen. Take, right? How long does it take? You know, and if you have if you have something that needs to happen in a hurry, well, I had a scene where somebody was uh, had to uh, was fighting with a with a gun, and it's like you know loading the gun, loading the pistol. You know, you, <laughs> well, you got to move it along. Yeah, you know, I move it along. So, well, I want to talk you? about Corbett, especially uh, spend considerable time on on Corbett, but we have to move through Boy's life because okay. I, what I think, generally speaking, I don't. This is not original with me. I'm sure you feel the same way, or that other critics of your work do. There seem to be two points of pivoting in your work. Mm. The first pivot was to Boy's Life. Then the second right. pivot, I think, is to Matthew Corbett. That's right. But you went That's to right. Boy's Life. You went. You have a southern setting. Mm -hmm. It's 1964. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, this is, I, 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 it's a page turner. I mean, I enjoyed reading it. There's no, <laughs> right. no, no, no quarrel about it. And I thought, this, this is wavering here. There are things in here that are supernatural, and then maybe they're not supernatural. Right. And do you think that that's yes. that that you went from what was clearly metaphysics to what was yeah. explainable? Well, I want it to be a little mix of both. I want it to be a little uh, phantasmagoric. Let's put it that uh -huh. way. Uh, a little bit of a dream sequence going on there, uh, backed up with a, with a young man who wants to be a writer. And oh, he has yeah. His, has his heart set on that. He doesn't know what's ahead for him, but, yeah. but at the time he has his heart set on that. Uh, so, you know, when I did uh, Boy's Life, it started out as a straight mystery murder set in a sure. small town. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, I just didn't like it because I was ready for something new. I was ready for something different. And I thought, you know, I, I'm just going to, I had this idea for a boy growing up in a small town who's interested in writing and all the things are yeah. going to happen. But you know, I didn't know what was going to happen because I, I don't work with an outline. So I just go. Good. Good. I, go I, have, I have sort of, the, I know the beginning, I know the middle, and I, I sort of know the end. So, so that's, those are my signpost scenes and I go from there. Right. All right, so, so I began to work on Boy's Life and I thought, you know, this is what I want to do. I don't want to do the mystery. But when I finished the book, I turned it in and, and the publishers were like, what is this? You know, this is not what you do. This not is exactly. Not, this is not what you do. This is not what we expect from you. And in a way, they were they were disappointed in it because it was not what they were expecting me to do. Uh, so we had a little go around about that. But publishers right. don't like change. They want you. No, to, they don't. If no, they don't. novel number one sold fifty thousand copies, they want number <laughs> number two to be just well, like number one. Absolutely, and it's it's a, it's for, that's from the business viewpoint. Sure, you know, and, and here we have the the age-old conflict and clash between, uh, quote, art and business. It right. goes on all the time, and here it is. Uh, many of the business people are great at business, <laughs> I suppose, but they don't <laughs> recognize uh, what is maybe good or bad about a book. And they don't know what's going on in your head, they don't know. which was you they want don't. to do something a little bit different and fresh. They don't understand that. No, have, no. have people accused you, people who read Boy's Life, have they accused you of, of studying Gabriel Garcia Marquez and A Hundred Years of Solitude? No. <laughs> well, there's a scene in Boy's Life. It's the last day of school in the spring. Um, All the boys have been released from class. Their teacher's dying, but they don't know it. Oh, really? Yeah. They go off and they celebrate. They get on their bikes and they go out in the woods a little bit out of town and wings sprout. Is that right? Out see, of I, their shoulder that, blades. That's right. I, you and know, they I, s soar up and fly around. And then they come really? back down, and the wings retreat back into their shoulder blades. And wow. it's done 
in <clears throat> as as writing, it's realism. Realism, yeah. And it's yeah. not referred to again. Right, right. I understand there it is. that. You know, I, I have to admit, I am uh, fairly illiterate in terms of reading. Uh, I have been accused of, of taking bits and pieces from other books and other this, that, and the other, but I have no, they're not books I've not read. I don't really read a lot because I read a lot of history and I read a lot of, uh, I read a lot of science fiction. I'm not so much into fantasy, and I really don't read a lot of horror. Uh, I read mystery, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I've been accused, well, you stole this and this, you stole this, and, this. and they're books that I've never read, I'm, I, some of the books I've never heard of before, so, so, but you can't answer that. You can't say, you know, it sounds awful to say, well, you know, I really don't read a lot in that genre that I, that I write in, because I know, and the reason for that is, I know how the tricks are done. It's like a magician, you well, know, you know how that, it's done. The, the, it, the scene itself is just charming. I mean, it's a wonderful scene. <laughs> And it's not, it's, it's not a question of borrowing. It's not that. It's the style that you used was that this, to the boys, you, the way you told that story of their wings, the dogs, by the way, sprout wings too. The oh, boys exactly. and their dogs yeah. all yeah. fly around for a bit. Yeah. It's done in a realistic style as if this happens once a year yes. on this day every year. Right. It's not remarkable right. to them. No, it's not and remarkable it, to them. <laughs> Well, it's it, it's and it's, it's a mix supposed to, of magic and real. It's supposed to capture the the idea of freedom that you're yeah, that sure, you're out you're sure. out of a confinement. Yeah. You're released from confinement, and so you you fly. Right. Is it in boy's life? There, I'm going to read you three sentences of your own. Oh boy. Own. Oh no, you're going to like it because I think this is, I think this is a big. Part I probably won't of, recognize it, but please go ahead. <clears throat> he has just looked up the word lyric which took me back to that wonderful word, story. It seemed to me at an early age that all human communication, whether it's TV, movies, or books, begins with somebody wanting to tell a story. That need to tell, to plug into a universal socket, is probably one of our grandest desires, and the need to hear stories, to live lives other than our own for even the briefest moment, is the key to the magic that was born in our bones. When I read that, I thought I had got to the heart of it. I think that's exactly right. Sure, sure. And, and that uh, compelled me to want to be a writer, the idea that I get to live in the skins of so many people. I get to see life through the eyes of so many yeah, people, and yeah. they will be very different from me. You know, I may write uh, an evil character, and somebody will say, well, how can you, how can you write? And I become like a method actor. I say, well, that's not really me. That's, I, I am being a method actor, but I am being able to see the world through uh, the eyes of somebody who's totally different from, from it, myself. Right. Moving to... <laughs> the the first of the Matthew Corbett books, there I mean, there's a couple of villains there that are yeah. just yeah. vile vile right. people. Right, right. And then <laughs> later in the what the third or f uh, what is the Matthew Corbett book it takes place mostly in Pennsylvania, where the uh, oh the uh, Mr. Slaughter Slaughter Mr. Slaughter. Yeah. I mean they don't get any more vile than that. You have a real <laughs> gift for for cruel, <laughs> vicious, Mr. Slaughter. sadistic yes, characters. Yes, yes, yes. Well, there was an actor, uh, a great British actor, uh, who who sort of was the Bela Lugosi and Boris, Boris Karloff of England. Uh, his last name was Slaughter. What's his first name? Well, anyway, he 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 did uh, originally. Um, stage plays, and he, he toured England. And he, yeah. he played the uh, the quintessential villain. And I happened to see a couple of old movies with him, uh, and I thought, you know, this guy—I've got to immortalize this guy. He was right. so—he was off the wall, so oh. good. That speaks the night bird. Sixteen ninety-nine. Yeah. Outside of Charleston, South Carolina. In, right. Did that city? It, Charlestown at that time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just just growing up. But uh, everything your was town pretty, is uh, wretched. No, no, the name of your little, uh, little ro um, Port Royal? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Fount Royal. Fount Royal. Fount Royal. Yeah. yeah, that's not real. That's No, it's not real. No, not real. Although there's a nice reference to but, Savannah, which is going Savannah. to... Which but is going but <laughs> based, on, based right. on a lot of towns that, that tried to grow right. and collapse, and there were, there were many. And to me, it was amazing how anybody could say, all right, we're going to try to build a town out of a swamp. Right. And, you know, they really tried, and they tried their best, and it went on quite a lot. Yeah. Why did you, <clears throat> why did you choose, 1699? Why did you choose, the country outside South Carolina? And I understand. I mean, if this is part of your <laughs> part of your narrative, your biographical narrative. Yeah. Is that you dug in on that research? Oh yeah. 
the food, oh, yeah. the eating Everything. utensils, the clothes, Absolutely. right down Absolutely. to the buttons on people's, right. on people's right. shirts. Right. Again, I wanted to do something different, and I felt it was time to do something different. Um, after, after Boy's Life and a book called Gone South, I decided I did not really want to go back to doing strictly the horror genre. I, I, I covered all the bases there, I thought. I'd, I'd done everything I needed to do there uh, at the time. And I thought, I just want to do something different. And what, what you know, so I did this, and it was going to be a, a, a one-off book. I wasn't going to do a series. But after I finished the, yeah, after I finished the book, uh, well, I had an editor who basically, you know, I, I left it open that, that he went on back to, New York, back to New York, and my editor at that time wanted him to be, to stay in uh, Fount Royal and, and, marry, uh, and, and, and marry her, the witch. And I thought, no. Rachel? He, Rachel. Yeah. You know, you know he, he needs to move on. He needs to move right. on. So, so anyway, when I came back to it, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in what happens to this young man when he goes back to New York. You know, he has, a, he has something to do in New York. He has right. a right to wrong, and that's, his, that's what he is all about, righting these wrongs, right. feeling that he is of, of use in that way, of worth, worthwhile in that way. So that's why I did the second book. And then it just carried on, and then I came right. up with the idea of Professor Fell, and the whole story arc. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, then, and then in the River of Souls, you have Matthew. I like the opening, by the way. I think the opening is a riot where he's paid 50 pounds oh, yeah. to escort the girl, <laughs> to, escort the girl. To, to, to the right. dance. Because right. anyone who escorts right. the girl to dance is in big <laughs> trouble. <laughs> well, I want there to be, you know, I want there to be the idea that what happens in one book, two or three books yes, back, right. will, will, something will come back, you know, two or three books hence. And and, it, and they connect. Everything connects. So when you read it, it when you read it, uh, one book at a time, it's fine. But when you read the whole series, oh, you're yeah. going to see that there are things that connect, right. and connect all the books together. And well, when, he, when Matthew gets up to New York in the second book, he starts kind of well, what is it? Problem solving. Problem solving. A, yes. A detective yes. agency. Detective agency. Of right. A, of, a of, the, of that of that era. Yeah. You did your research largely in Williamstown, in uh, Williamsburg. Williamsburg. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah at the library there, and also you know their their room, uh, their storage room where they keep everything under right. temperature control. And a know. and a good deal of Salem, Massachusetts worked its way in. Absolutely there too. right. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Cotton Mather and Wonders well, of were, the Invisible World. And there were yeah, and there were other witchcraft trials going sure. on at the time too. Sure. Uh, and there were some in. Uh, what, <clears throat> what attracted me is that there was one in in the, in the Carolina colony going on, uh, and it was mm -hmm. not, not as well known as the Salem Witchcraft Trial. Reading along from early to middle to late, one of the things that I've come to expect, or I, I, I came to expect it by the time I was halfway through River of Souls, <laughs> is that the monster, <clears throat> who seems to be supernatural, whether it, right. actually this, part, this partly happens even in Boy's Life, but it turns out in well, in Speaks the Nightbird, the monster, one-eyed Jack, is not a supernatural monster. Right. right. It's a bear. Right. And in River of Souls, there's, <clears throat> a, yeah. it turns out it's, it's a panther it's a, it's of a, a, a deformed by the fire. Deformed. Fire. So it's yeah. monstrous. A, monstr <laughs> a monstrosity. Uh, in a way, I wanted to stay away. I wanted to be a little strange and a little yeah. off the wall, but I did right. not necessarily want it to be supernatural. Uh, I used to enjoy the uh, the old Hammer films, uh, uh, the Hammer films from England. And yeah. They did Dracula. They did uh, oh, all, sure, you know they did sure, all those great yeah. British themed uh, uh, horror movies. But there were some that were not supernatural. They were just plain creepy. I mean, yeah. and, and those are the ones I think I remember the most. That yeah. They they had this 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 atmosphere of dread and atmosphere of horror, but they were not necessarily supernatural in that sense. So that's really what I wanted to try to capture. But human series. fear takes the thing that's horrible takes the thing, and makes it into takes a, the thing, makes it supernatural. That is right, makes it supernatural. The re, the, you're playing with the reader's head something terrible, yeah, as, you, know I am. as you know. <laughs> as I, yes, yes. One little spot in River of Souls, which I, 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 I lingered on it, the rejected Indians, there's a tribe of right. rejected. Rejected because they're insane. Are they insane. mentally retarded? And, oh, they're insane. They're insane. They're, they've, done something, they've done something to be ostracized from, the, from their tribes. And so they're all put together. They're like, you know, we, don't, we want you away yeah. because they've done something, something outside of the legal limits of their tribe 
or they're or they've exhibited some some insanity. You know, so they're all they're all put together in one psychotic place. Indians. Psychotic. Yes. <laughs> they all right. live together. Right. So all live God together. help you if you God help you if you fall get in, in there. with them. That is right. Then your then your your head is used as a <laughs> soccer ball. So <laughs> is there any is there any real? Any, uh, you did, know, I, I did that come out of anywhere? It, it came out of the idea that that uh, you know I, I have read about uh, Indians who uh, ostracized people in their tribes and where did they go? And if they ostracized people in the tribes, you know, maybe there could be a place where all these people gathered and they just, and there was no, there was no uh, internal law to keep anything from happening. It just was, you know, just a law of survival and just well, insanity that, that crazy. one absolutely <laughs> so, terrifying little yeah. tr tribe you got yeah. going there. Yeah. And very, the other tribe that you have in that, in that book is very civilized. Very civilized, yes. And when they find right. valuable things, they decorate this they, little shit. They decorate the lot with it. <laughs> no, that's yeah. fine. We have less, I know it sounds peculiar, but we have less than a minute. Oh. Um, so at this point, I always ask people, um, where next? What next? What, what do you have in mind? I'm doing a book now uh, set in New Orleans in the 30s oh. uh, about a kidnapping. Oh. Uh, it involves, a, and my hero is a, a young black man who, uh, who is 22 years old, and he's a red cap at the train station. He gets involved in a kidnapping case, and I'm really enjoying doing 1930s style. Uh, reading and writing also. Uh, next is uh, Cardinal Black. That's next in the in the Matthew series. Uh, and well, let's move ahead from there. You've had Matthew in, well, you've had him in Fount Royal. You've had him in Charlestown. You've had him in New York. You've had him in the Pennsylvania woods. Once up in New England. Uh, yeah, and yeah. And then back. I'm hoping to Where get him. Where is he now? I'm hoping to get him before the series is done to Russia. No. Oh. Yes. In 1704? We're going to try to do that. We're going to try to do that. That may not work out, but that's oh, sort of what right. I want to do. If you, if you want. <laughs> if I want to, I'm going to give it a shot. Matthew to go shot. to Russia. By God, he will go to Russia. I don't there you have, go. I we'll don't see. have any doubt about it. I <laughs> have to work that out, but we'll see. Uh, well, I have certainly enjoyed our talk. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for you. having me and doing this. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.